I want you to take your Bible as soon as I find mine. And uh, turn to the book of Judges, chapter 7. I've um, been preaching on prayer. I may, I may be done with that. And those are the, um, the seven pieces of armor of God. That God has given to us by grace to be able to defend ourselves against the principalities, the powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. While you're turning to Judges chapter 7 briefly, I want to run through some uh, of the announcements. I'm trying to find a way to maybe uh, expedite some of the service a little bit. So I'm, so I'm not unnecessarily holding you long. Now, if it's necessary to hold you long, I don't mind at all. If God's going to move in people's lives, and I feel that He is, then I'm not going to cut God short. Uh, I know some. I know people traditionally. They say, you know, church is out at noon. Uh, I've never really seen that written down, and um, but I do. I understand that. You know, we get hungry around that time, and and. Maybe I've just kind of gone way past my time that you can listen to me. But so I want to try to expedite the service a little bit to allow for the most important thing that we do here. And that is to preach the word of God. And uh, so anyway, while you're doing that very quickly, homecoming, August 6th, 7th and 8th. Uh, we hope that a lot of people are going to be joining us that time. Be, it'd be great. It would be great for the first time that we didn't have enough room for everybody. It would be wonderful uh, for that to be able to happen. But some of the COVID restrictions have been reduced. And um, so that's allowed some people to be able to leave their state. And we're thankful for that. Um, and then you see the schedule there in the bulletin. Friday night, uh, sandwiches and chips, 530. Service begin at 7 o'clock. Next morning, uh, homemade gravy. We bought sausage and bacon and lard. Lard makes good gravy. All things in moderate. Lisa said, you're going to give them a heart attack. This it won't be for another 20 years. I ain't worried about it. And then the service uh, will begin the teaching. 930 lunch will follow. Uh, pulled pork and sides. We asked the ladies bring a dessert Sunday morning. Have our services 9.45 Sunday school. Church service 10.45. Have a dinner following that morning service. Uh, church will provide the meat. We ask everyone else to bring a side dish and dessert for Sunday. Um, and then in your bulletin you should have a prayer list in there. Uh, this Wednesday night. We will not have service here this Wednesday night. Write that down so you don't forget it. Lisa and I will be in Harrison, Arkansas, um, preaching for Brother Mike Hutzel in Oak Lane Church. And he's invited some other churches. You pray for that church. Pray for Brother Mike Hutzel and pray for me. I've asked him twice now, did I have liberty on what to speak about? And he said, yes, he should never do that. Should never do that. Um, so just pray that God will show me what He wants me to do, do the right thing, and um, that God will bless it. I love the Oak Lane Church; they're good people. They, I consider them a sister church to us. We just, they just got good people in it, like the people here at Bethel. Y'all would get along well with them. They're just mountain folk down in Arkansas, and they, I just love them to death. So be praying for us and we'll be preaching that Wednesday and then Lisa and I are going to take a couple days and just spend together in Branson. And then we have the uh, meeting coming up in Las Vegas, Nevada at the uh, Mutual UFO Network Convention. We are there going to be passing out thousands of DVDs. They're going out free. They uh, sent me an email asking me for all of our church information, our name, address, Phone number, tax ID stuff, and everything like that, because 
whatever people sell there in Nevada, Nevada's going to get sales tax out of it. Well, guess what? We'll be the only booth there not having to pay sales tax. Yes. I don't, I, I right now, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm speaking out there. They, I'm not part of the conference speaking thing. Uh, right now, it's just our... Uh, Oh, Wednesday, yes, but it'll be Mike Hutzel's church. It'll be Oak Lane. It, look under Mike Hutzel Ministry on Sermon Audio. They stream under that, and so be looking under that for his stream, all right? Um, so I'm glad you, I appreciate you bringing that up, because, yes, there, there will be streaming done of that, but you'll have to look for it under uh, Mike Hutzel Ministry on Sermon Audio. Um, but anyway, the uh, what was I going to say about the, the conference down there? I, I'm not scheduled to speak down there. Um, but, um, oh, I remember what it was. We finally have, and I appreciate a brother named Stan. I'm not going to give his last name. Uh, I'll let God give him the thanks and the praise and everything like that. But he helped me put up a website called ufopastor.com. It's up and running. And yes, I've got stickers. UFOpastor.com Lisa's already told me I can't stick them on the car. And I'm going to keep my word. All right. I'm just not going to tell her where I'm going to stick them. All right. Judges chapter 7. Turn there, please. This is Gideon. Gideon is a fascinating... Gideon is a good man. I like Gideon. Gideon is a man that is a lot like me, especially uh, days like this. I have my days where I need a lot of assurance. I need a lot of assurance. I need a, I, I, I guess God just won't let me be arrogant or cocky or prideful about my salvation. I'm thankful for my salvation. But he won't let me get too high up in the clouds over it. Because let me tell you what that does. You become what the Bible says, a cloud without water. Which means you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. And I went to Bible college with guys that were like that. And I, hate, I, I just, I say I hated them. I, I, back then I did. I could not stand those guys. They were, they were related to big names in the denomination. They could do no wrong. They were always putting on a spiritual show on the outside. And then judging guys like me because I didn't do it. I wouldn't act like them. But I knew some of their sins. I knew some of the things they had done. Yes. Yeah, there's a little bit of ring. Michael, maybe turn this speaker down a little bit. All right. They. Um, so I, I just don't like being and God won't let me be too high and mighty. He always has found a way to keep me humble, keep me down on my knees, keep me begging for mercy, begging for help. In every, just about every day it's like that. And that's Gideon. Gideon always needed somebody. God, he always needed God to reassure to him. Boy, it's still ringing, isn't it? Let me see if I can... Cut some of this down over here. There we go. Hey, that might help. Check one, two. That was it right there. So anyway, I want us to pick it up in Judges chapter 7, verse 1. We're going to find out. Now remember, Gideon, when he's first approached by the angel of the Lord, who I believe is Christ, said that God is with thee. God's going to use you. Gideon said, well, if God's, if God's with us, which is not what God said. God, God said, I'm with you, Gideon. 
Gideon said, well, God, if, if God's with us, then why are we under bondage? Why is it that I'm having to hide my grain and, and pull in my grain at night to hide it from the Philistines who'll steal it during the daytime? If God's that much for us, and you may be, you may very well be of that crowd who is always saying, well, I don't think God really is on our side. If God's on our side, how come he hasn't done this? How come he hasn't done that? So on and so on. Down in the mouth all the time. Running everything down all the time. And Gideon's tired of it. He's threshing at night so he won't get caught during the day doing it and have to give away everything that he's threshed over to the Philistines. He's tired of it. And so God said, well, I'm going to give you a sign. He said, hold on right here. He went and got a kid and slew it and boiled the meat and, and uh, made cakes of flour and brought the meat, brought the, the, uh, the, the water that he boiled it in, that broth, and he brought the bread. And he said, here's my present to you. And the angel of the Lord said, pour the broth out onto the ground. Poured it out onto the ground. Well, that's gone. So he took the bread and he took the flesh and put it on a rock. The angel of the Lord touched it and it burned it all up. Consumed it up in a smoke and now it's gone in ashes. Gideon knew then that it was the angel of the Lord. I believe because he understood that God doesn't take our presence. He doesn't accept our presence. What is that song we sing? Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. So we have nothing that we can offer God to gain his blessings from us. Other than a crying heart to God. God will accept that. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. So now Judges 7 verse 1. Then Jeru Baal. Remember what that word means. Will Baal plead with Gideon? Because Gideon took, by the, by the order of God, he took the altar of Baal, broke it up, uh, slew an oxen on the, the grove wood that he had cut down that was given to Ashtaroth and made a sacrifice unto the Lord with that. In other words, he's cutting off the old ways. However my daddy did it, however our forefathers did it, it was wrong, it doesn't work, so I'm cutting it off now. I'm not going to live that life anymore. I'm going to follow what God says and only follow what God said and God bless that. So that's why they called him Jerob Baal, who is Gideon. And all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them. Well, now, think, now, underline that in your verse, John. Where are the enemies? They're on the north side. What does that tell you? It's a prophecy. All through Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, in Joel, in other places. God said there is an army coming out of the north country. Let me fill you in on your eighth grade geology. Or, yeah, yeah, it was it not geology or geology something? Geography. Thank you. Let me, let me our educate you. There is no country in the north. There's no nation up there. There's no land up there. No one's ever claimed it. So where are they coming from? The place that God came from out of the north in Ezekiel chapter 1 is the place they're coming from. They're not of this world. That fourth kingdom in Daniel does not come from any place on this earth. Else we could beat them. But they're coming from a much farther away place. In the next watchman, I'll show you that. But they were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel should vaunt themselves against me, saying, By an own hand have saved me. Now therefore go to pro proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Who is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart only from, your, from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand. There remained ten thousand. 
The Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, ask for your blessings to help me to preach this the best way that I can. Father, Lord, wherever I'm wrong, where, Father, whatever weakness is in my flesh today, whatever weakness is in my mouth and my heart and my mind, I pray, dear God, Father, that you would be sovereign today. And Father, that you would be the preacher. You would stand in front of this congregation and you would give forth a message to each and every heart. I, Father, I believe... That if there's 70 people in this room today, you can preach 70 different messages to each and every one of them from this one pulpit. Is what I believe. And I, Father, not only that, but all the people that are online. You can preach a message to them. They'll get something out of it, Father, that I, I never really thought of. So, Father, that's what I'm asking you to do today. I have nothing in me today. I have nothing. My flesh is weak. My mind is weak. My spirit is tired. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, Lord, that you would just meet the needs of your people today. They're your people. And I know you love them. And I know some of them are afraid. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would just bless them and help them today. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for showing us, God, that it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. I want you to notice, if you do the math, if you look in verses, um, if you look in verse 3, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand. There remained ten thousand. How many people was it all together? The math is easy. Thirty-two thousand people started out. Being an army for Gideon. And their, and their thinking, their thinking was this. If we can get more people... To be on our side, then surely we will win. Now this lesson, and many others like it, but this one really points it out. God says it in no uncertain terms. Gideon, you have way too many. Because I know Israel. And I know that, let's say that you found 50,000 more. Well, surely that would do the trick. And if they ended up winning the battle, then Israel is going to gloat. They're going to brag. They're going to say, by our hand, have we defeated the Midianites? We're a powerful army. Our nation increases its Defense budget every year, every two years, every four years, depending on who's in the Congress and depending on who's in the White House. But we keep increasing the budget. Thinking that if we have more than the other people have, then surely everybody will be afraid of us. And I'm saying to you, if we had Five million soldiers in our army. If we had more soldiers than Russia and China put together, we could still lose. If God wasn't on our side. So he's got too many. And I want you to notice the first group. Whosoever, verse 3, is fearful and afraid, let him return. Now, is God angry about this? I don't really think so. I don't really think so. You know, there are people in this church that have asked me, which is the right thing to do, that's the law. 
if they can conceal a deadly weapon and keep it in the church service in case somebody comes in, does what some idiots have done, come in to helpless church people and shoot everybody, kill people, so on and so on. Brother Wayne Shirk, you remember him, that was his place there. And the reason why he sat over there, and I bought that plaque for him. The reason why he sat there was so he could watch that door and he could watch that door. And he's basically said, I'm sitting here so that if I see anybody coming in, I'm going to go find out what they're doing. If I see them carrying a gun, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to shoot them. There are some who carry the guns because there are others here who would not be able to do that. They wouldn't be able to do it. Not everybody's that kind of soldier. Not everybody can pull a weapon out real fast and shoot somebody in the face. Not everybody's cut out for that. Doesn't mean that you're no good. It doesn't mean anything like that. What that means is that those who are good at it <clears throat> and those who can do it, they don't mind standing forward and protecting those who can't do it for themselves. That's the essence of Christianity, by the way. Christ knew that you and I are, what does it say? We're the fearful and afraid. We're the ones, I mentioned this earlier, who are afraid to die. If you were told you've got cancer, you've got three months to live. I'm not sure how that, I'm not sure how you would deal with that. I wouldn't deal with it very well. Neither would my wife. If somebody told her that she had cancer, she had three months to live, I wouldn't deal with that very well at all. In fact, you'd probably have to scoop me up off the floor, carry me out to the car. I would not be able to handle that very well. I didn't handle very well the first time they told her she had cancer. That made me fearful. And so number one, for those of you who are afraid, and for those of you who are fearful, for those of you who could not fight, don't worry. God's always got somebody that's going to fight for you. Whether it's going to be a brother or a sister who's praying for you. A brother or sister who's going to be strong for you. A brother or sister that maybe God lays scripture on their heart. And they come to you and they say, can I read you a verse of scripture? Can I encourage you with this today? Can I be a blessing to you today? They will be there for you because you are fearful and afraid. And there is nothing you can do about it. Anybody... From any pulpit who tells you that being fearful and afraid is a fault of your own, that you need to think positive thoughts and chase those things out of your mind. They have no idea what they're talking about, or they do, they're just lying through their teeth. So we have the fearful and afraid. Let them depart. Then there remain, uh, they return to the people 22,000. Now we got 10,000 left. The Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that w of whom I say unto thee, they shall go with thee. The same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee. The same shall not go. Now we know this story. Look in verse 5. So he brought down the people unto the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth. Him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink, the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down by their knees to drink the water. In other words, there were some people who would scoop it up, lap it up with like a dog. And there were some people, this is how I'd do it. I'd just stick my face down in the water and go <laughs> like that. Bugs and all, dirt and all, I'd do it. If I was thirsty enough, I'd do it. 
And so, verse 7. The Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped, will I save you? Now, I don't know exactly what the difference was between those who stuck their face down in the water and sucked it all in or those who scooped it up and lapped it up with their tongue. I don't know. I've heard some people say, well, you know, the people that picked it up with their, with their hand and lapped it up, they had to set their, their spears down in order to do it while the others had the spear in their hand. They just stuck their face down. In the, I, I don't know. What I know is this. God wasn't looking for soldiers. He wasn't looking for soldiers because none of those guys were going to fight. None of them. He was looking for people, probably because they did set their weapons down and use the, their hand to cut the water up and drink like that. Maybe it was because they did set their weapons down and lapped it up like that. Maybe that's why God chose them. Those are the ones that I want. Because I don't need fighters. All I need is 300 men that can hold a pitcher in one hand and a sword in the other and shout and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon! And 300 men did that. And the whole army died of the enemy. Um, verse 7, the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped up, will I save you? And deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go every man unto his place. So the people took victuals in their hand, that's victuals, we call it, food, and their trumpets. And they sent all the rest of Israel, every man into his tent, and retained those 300 men, and the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. Now, let's get, God's picked his army. He's got 300 men, all of which, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, shall every word be established, the Bible says. You can think of the 300 as maybe the, a representation of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. That's the number for resurrection. Jesus resurrected on the third day and so on. You can think of it that way. But it just basically represents a number that is smaller than what most generals look for in an army. But remember, they are not going to fight this battle. God is going to do that for them. But now Gideon... If we go to verse 9, God's going to say it to Gideon again. In fact, God's going to sort of get ahead of Gideon. Before Gideon, if you remember, last Sunday we talked about the fleece that Gideon laid before the Lord. Lord, if the fleece be dry and the ground be wet, then I'll believe you. And it was so the next day. Lord, let me just, give me just, give me just one more. If I lay the fleece out and it's, uh, uh, dry and the ground is wet, the opposite, then I'll believe you. And God was long suffering with him and, and did that one as well. Now God's going to ad jump advance of him. He's going to get ahead of him because he knows Gideon and God knows you. I have always in my life been someone who was, who never, uh, I don't know how to put this. I was never satisfied with what love people gave me. I was always afraid that people didn't like me. I was always afraid that uh, people were going to reject me. I was always afraid that 
If I tried to make friends, they would push me out of their group and I couldn't be in their group. And um, it caused me to do some weird stuff when I was a kid. I'm glad my mom and my sister are not here. Because they would tell you the weird stuff that I did when I was a kid. Always needing acceptance. And you know, that little boy hasn't changed in me. He's still there. Always needing reassurance. Always needing to know that I fit in. I went to one Bible college and uh, the first year I didn't do so well. I didn't fit in very well. So I changed a lot of the things that I believed so that I would fit in. One of them was over the Bible issue, John. That's what made me do it. Because amongst the student body, I had a reputation. At Hogwarts, one of them extremist guys. And we don't like that. So at the end of my first year, during that summer, I decided that I didn't want to be that way anymore. And it paid off. I got to be student body chaplain. Everybody started liking me. And I enjoyed that. When I left that college and went to a college out in Tennessee, I found out it was one of those upper class colleges where the elite of the denomination went. The elite of the denomination sent their sons and their daughters to marry the elite of the other people in the denomination to make contacts with and these families had way more money than my family my family lived in a mobile home their families lived in hundred two hundred thousand dollar homes and uh, I found myself fitting in with the other people that didn't get accepted well either that was my game when I got out of Bible college and was my first church out at Richwoods, trying to pastor that church. I found myself wanting to get in with the leaders in the denomination. Which caused me then further to compromise things that I had been taught, things that I at one time stood for. I wanted them to notice me, I wanted them to recognize me, I wanted them to favor me. I wanted, to, I wanted to have a name among them. I wanted to be asked to preach at the, at the meetings. I wanted this. I want, that's what I was chasing down. And how God brought me out of that was God used the very men that I looked up to, that I was trying to grab their favor. God used those men to offend me, I'm, and I mean cut me down to the heart to where I couldn't even face them anymore. And what I didn't realize was God was removing me away from that denomination and that group of people because he knew that if I was still in with them, I would not preach against the things they were doing wrong. So I had to do it. And I realize now it's paid off. This church is free and nobody tells us what we can and cannot preach. And it wasn't just my idea, Brother Sterling, we, Brother Joe, that we was right along with it. Hey. They never help us anyway. Why should we? All they want is our money. Why should we keep pouring money into them, get nothing out of it? 
Right, Sterling? Sounds good to me. But I admit it's still in my nature. It's still in my nature to want that token of acceptance. And that's Gideon. I, I preached this years ago, and I called it the doctrine of insecurity. Instead of having security, we are insecure. We are always asking God for, for another sign, another token, a, a, another blessing to God, do you really love me? God, do you love me today? God, do you love me even though what I did was wrong? God, do you still love me? So in, in, in verse 9 of chapter 7, the Bible says it came to pass the same night. And, and let me say this too. I'm pretty bad to wear my feelings on my shoulders. That I know. That I know. I don't like it. I don't like it. But sometimes I'm pretty bad to wear my feelings on my shoulders. Y'all understand what that means, don't you? Where people can see it. And I see Gideon as this kind of person. So verse 9, it came to pass on the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down into the host, for I have delivered it into thine head. So you tell me that, and I'm just going, I don't know about this, God. But he said, but if thou fear to go down, God knew Gideon. Go thou with Phura, thy servant, down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say, and afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then he went down, because Gideon's got to be thinking, God, you just run off most of my army. I've only got 300 men. What am I going to do with 300 men? And let me, let me correct some Facebook doctrine for you. Facebook Bible doctrine says so and so needs prayer. If we can get a thousand of God's people to pray for them, God will bless them. That's a lie. It's a lie. Now, I'm not saying it is a nice to have a thousand people praying for you. But you don't need a thousand. You could take just one. Two. In fact, in fact, were two or more gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And he said, if any two of you agree is touching on anything in heaven and earth, it shall be done. Now I've got, I'm going to say this and I'm, I'm not going to give a lot of, I'm not going to say who they were and I'm not going to give a lot of doctrine about this. But in one week's time, I've had two different women contact us. And ask me this question. Pastor. One of the ladies I know. I, I've met her before. Pastor. Me and my husband. We've been married. Such and such years. A long time. I'm trying to live for the Lord. He's not. And our relationship is getting worse. And worse. And worse. And one lady said, I just sometimes I feel like my husband's got a devil in him. And I just can't, I can't take it anymore. He's very antagonistic against me. 
and he won't he won't come to church and he doesn't want me watching church online and doesn't want he doesn't like you brother mike and he's almost kind of put put his foot down that it's either god or him and she said, I want to know if I can divorce him. She said, now he's not in any adultery. He's not committed fornication that I know of. But can I divorce him? I, I just feel like I can't serve God until... And then an, an, another lady wrote, wrote an email. Almost the exact same thing within several days of each other. Saying the same thing. And here's what I told them. I read them out of 1 Corinthians, I think it was chapter 7. Where God says, if the unbelieving husband be pleased to keep you, then I'm paraphrasing, stay with him. For the believing wife sanctifieth the unbelieving husband. And then I read 1 Peter chapter 3, where it says that if any of the wives have a husband who is not a believer, stay with him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and is won by her chaste conversation of the Lord. And it's the only place in the whole Bible where it says a man can be saved without the Bible. He's saved by the chaste conversation of the wife. That is exactly how Danny got saved. Exactly. My dad, all the time I'm growing up, never went to church. Meanwhile, mom got us. She, I mean, as soon as we started going here, she gave her life to the Lord. Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Five weeks of revival meeting, quarterly meetings. We went to church camp. We did everything. Dad stayed at home. Dad and I actually got into it a couple times. Over the church issue. I should have never disrespected my dad, but I did. And then after I left for Bible college, you know what happened? God started dealing with my dad. And he started going to church with my mom on Sunday morning. And then after now, the night that I answered the call to preach, after mom called him and he said, well, he's not old enough to know what he should be doing in life, which hurt my feelings. The night that I preached at Richwoods and they ordained me and laid hands on me, and ordained me to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. My dad walked out and said, son, I'm proud of you. And his faith kept growing. He told Sterling, we was going down for deer hunting one year. He told Sterling, he said, if God had delivered me from drinking that nasty 905 beer, he said, I'd be dead by now. I'd never heard my dad talk like that. And the last thing that my dad did in this world was pray with me, his son. God can do it when nobody else can. God can do it. Now, I don't know why I threw that in there, but it just... I don't know, been, I've been meaning to tell that story. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's other women out there under the same situation. But God wanted to show Gideon what was going on. He wanted him to have that confidence. And these two women that I'm talking about, they've lost confidence. And they're ready to get out. They said, it's almost like impossible for me to serve God. So why don't you just wait on the Lord? So he said, but if thou fear to go down in verse 10, 
Go thou, go thou with Furah thy servant down to the host, and thou shalt hear what they say. And afterwards shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Furah his servant out, uh, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number, as the sand by the seaside for multitude. By the way, where you see that like grasshoppers for multitude, I think that's a prophet, I think that's a foreshadowing of Revelation 9. I really do. And it said in verse 13, And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow, and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian. That must have been a huge cake of barley bread. I'm thinking like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man from Ghostbusters. Come. Come tumbling in to the host of the Midian and came into a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it and that the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, this is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. God gave one of those men a dream saying, A big barley loaf come rolling in and smash my tent, laying it down and killed us all. The other man said, Do you know what that is? That's Gideon. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. And pretty soon, you can imagine, word got around the host of the Midian of that dream that that one guy had. Because they were superstitious. So on the night that Gideon raised his sword and his 300 men with him, and they broke the pitchers, and the lights all shone forth, Ah, oh, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon! They must have thought there was 20,000 people behind every one of those 300 men. Oh no, we're dead! And they ran! God took care of it. God got the victory. So let me read some verses here for you. Psalm 18, 4. The sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. And let me tell you something. It is not a sin to be afraid. It's not. Turn to Psalm 56 and I'm going to let you go. Psalm 56. Some of you are afraid. I'm going to say this again. And I, I please, please. I beg the long suffering of you people with your pastor. Please suffer long with me when I say something to you. Some of you have filled your minds with so much fear because of the internet. I know because I was doing it. I was reading so many conspiracy things on the internet that it, it literally had me almost in panic states over what I was reading. I am begging you, get off that internet. Now, if you want to watch cat videos, cat videos are funny. You want to watch car crashes, I like watching car crashes. You want to watch skateboarders do stupid stuff, ended up busting their face on concrete. Watch that. But get off the conspiracy junk. It's making you afraid 
of everything. And you know what? There isn't a thing in the world that you're going to do to stop whatever's coming. Not a thing. If God's got it in his plan, it's going to happen. And you know what? Let it happen. That just puts us one day closer to going to heaven. Well, I'm afraid. I've read that they, they're going to try to kill us all. Are we not going to heaven? Let them kill us all. What are we got to be afraid of with that? So Psalm 56 verse 1. Be merciful, be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Mine enemies would swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. And yes, this Bible's right. There are more people in this world that are they're not just sinners. They're hateful, angry, wrathful sinners who don't like Christians talking to them about their sin. And they would kill you if they thought they could get away with it. Verse 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. That means you're not afraid of the 5G rollouts. You're not afraid of the new um, uh, electric meters. You're not afraid of the pharmaceuticals. You're not afraid of, of the pills, the potions, the needles. You're not afraid. Maybe they do want to kill us all. You're not afraid. Every day they rest my words. Verse 5. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps. They wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wanderings. Watch this. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Let me tell you what God does with every one of my tears. He stores them up in a bottle. He never lets any of them out, but what he saves them up. And he looks at them and he says, those are the tears of my son. I've got children that are going through hard times right now. And I, my children, I want you to know your daddy and your mama pray for you every day. And every tear you cry, we care about it. And if us, we can do that being evil, how much more your heavenly father takes every tear that you cry and he saves it up in a bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I, verse 9, when I cry unto thee, then shall my enemies turn back. This I know, for God is with me. In God will I praise his what? In the Lord will I praise his what? In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee, for thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? When you have a God so good to you, that even Gideon, who doubted every day of his life, God still had mercy on him and saved many people by his hand alone. And he was the least of his family. And the, his family was the poorest family you could find. And yet God chose him. 
A man full of fear. A man full of self-disappointment. What do they call it? Can't think of the word. But you get what I'm saying. If God can use him and reassure him that he's going to give him the victory, he has nothing to be afraid of. It's the same God that you and I serve. He'll do the same thing for you. Let's bow our heads.